Thank you so much, Mrs. Mitchell. I mean, it's good to know that God is interceding on our behalf. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm glad to know that God is interceding on my behalf tonight. And Jesus is interceding for me as I preach, that he would uh, be giving me the words to say and praying for me. He's the best person that could be praying for me, that's for sure. So if you turn your Bibles to Amos chapter number 4, Amos chapter number 4, uh, we're going to be looking, reading verses 4 through 13. Um, so I am super excited about Vacation Bible School this week. Uh, at the end, uh, during our announcement times, I have a video that we're going to show, uh, bloopers of some things as we were making the skits. I know some of the kids that were in the videos are probably super excited to watch themselves make mistakes and stuff, but I'm excited about this week. It's different than normal. You know, a lot of things we've been doing recently have been different, but, uh, it's also good to see that even though it's been different, God can work through it in amazing ways. I mean, we're on TV, uh, getting people watching there that would pr maybe never come into our church and people watching online who uh, maybe would never come to the church. I, uh, people watching with, with friends who they themselves would never go to a church, but since they're friends watching, they might as well watch along with them. And it's been exciting to see what God's done in our country and in our church um, these past few months. But a, uh, Amos chapter number four, Hopefully you're there. We're going to start in verse number four. It says, Come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal, multiply transgression, and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the free offerings, for this liketh you. O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest and I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One, pe one piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it raineth not withered. So two or three cities wandered about to one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. The palmer worm devoured them. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses. And I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nose nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet... Have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord? Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto, you, unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with us tonight, Lord, that your hand would be upon our service. I pray that you would help me as I speak, that I would speak exactly the words that you would have me to say, Lord, that I would um, be sensitive to your spirit, Lord, and that you would lead, and that you would do a work in our hearts tonight. I pray that you would help us tonight to return to you, Lord, to come to you, Lord, to, to have that desire to be close to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, as we look in Amos chapter number four here, there's a phrase that's repeated over and over again. He says, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. He says that over and over to them. Amos is telling them, I, I've done this, I've done that, and you haven't returned to me. So we're going to look first, we've got to see, well, what is their problem? What is going on with the Israelites at this time? So we see their, their problem in verses number four and five. We see that they worshipped their own way. They were doing things how they wanted to do things. They didn't worship the way God commanded them to. You see, it, the Israelites were commanded to go and worship at, in Jerusalem. They were commanded to go to Jerusalem, worship there. That's where they were supposed to worship. And yet we see here, they were worshiping at Bethel, and they were worshiping at Gilgal. And they were doing it in a, not, not the way that God had commanded them to do it. They were not worshiping the way that God wanted them to worship. In fact, as you read... Um, in later passages, we see that not only were they worshiping God in the wrong way, they had added to that they were worshiping idols, and they were trying to be more like the countries around them and trying to do things their way as well. So we'll, you know, we'll add these idols to our worship as well, and they just weren't doing things how God wanted them to do it in their, in their worship. 
they did some things the way God commanded them. And, uh, you know, I, as I read it, I can't help but just sense some sarcasm that God, as God speaks and is telling them, okay, like, go ahead, do these things. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. He's telling them to bring their sacrifice every morning. And some of these things are things that they're commanded to do. Bring sacrifices every morning. Bring their tithes every three years. These are things that they had been commanded to do. And he says, you can go ahead and do those things, but it doesn't mean anything. You know, you can go ahead and do these things your way. And the, the words that, that get me the most um, is in verse 5, towards the end, end of verse 5. He said, go ahead, do these things that you're planning to some of these things that I command you to do, go ahead and do these. Why? He said, for this liketh you. In other words, oh, you can go ahead and do those things because those are the things that you like to do. You know what? You, you can pick and choose and say, well, we're not going to worship in Jerusalem because we don't really like uh, the people that live over there. So we're going to worship in Gilgal. We're going to worship where we want to worship. But we're going to do these other things that, that you want us to do, God, because we like doing those things. We think those things are good. So they were doing things the way they wanted to. For this liketh you. They chose to worship based on what they wanted, and they left God out of it. You know, how many times do we do the exact same thing? We, we pick and choose what God wants us to do based on what we want. Say, so God says, okay, go ahead. Go to, get dressed, put on your suit and tie, and go to church Sunday morning because you like doing it. You want to go talk to your friends there. Go ahead. Have fun. That's what you like to do, so do it. But don't pretend you're doing it for me. Hey, go ahead. Hey, you, you, like, uh, you like giving money to the church because it helps you feel better about yourself. It helps you feel like you're, you're giving towards something. Go ahead and do it, but don't pretend you're doing it because of me. And th these are good things, right? We should be in church. We should be giving to the church. These are all very good things to do. And the Israelites were doing some things that were good things to do, but there was no connection with God. There was no relationship with God. There, there, the reason they were doing it had nothing to do with God. It was because th those were the things that they liked to do. They were the things that were good in their own eyes. And they refused to return to God. They were doing some of the right things. And they, they, they knew the right things to do, but they, they had left God out of it. They weren't returning to God the way that they were supposed to. And over and over again, it says in verses 6 through 11, Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And I think it's interesting he uses the word returned. That means they had been where they were supposed to be at one time, but they weren't anymore. And you know what? Many of us, we have been where we're supposed to be. We've been where we're supposed to be in our relationship with God. We've been close to God like we should be, but we're not anymore. And God tonight, he wants you to return to him. He wants you to come back to him. He wants you to get back to the place that, that you know you're supposed to be. God tells them that he has tried so many different things to get their attention and yet nothing and yet they just keep doing things their own way he said uh he said he, he he's brought about pestilence he's brought about he's brought about all these problems and yet there they are doing it their own way so i've smitten you with blasting with mildew he he has he has brought them problems on their crops He's given them, at, at the beginning, the first time I read this in verse 6, I've given you cleanness of teeth. Well, what does that mean? I mean, it's a good thing to have clean teeth, right? I mean, come on. I mean, God's given them cleanness of teeth. I'll take that. And uh, so I had to look it up to see, okay, well, what does that mean? Why is this a bad thing? Israelites like having dirty teeth or what's going on here? But I said, cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread. And there's a connection there. The reason their teeth is clean isn't because they've, uh, they're using crest and brushing their teeth every morning. The reason their teeth are clean is because they don't have any food to eat. God says, I gave you a lack of food, you didn't have any food, and still you didn't come, with, come to me. I've withhold the rain. He, he held the rain back from them that they needed for their crops, and yet they still didn't come to him. He figured, you know what? You know, I'm the God that's in control of the rain. I'm the God that, that's in control of all those things. So when you're lacking rain, you're going to come back to me and ask me for, uh, for help. Nothing. And he, he's smitten them with, with the mildew. He, he's, he's hurt their gardens and their vineyards and still nothing. And, you know, we see a cycle in, in Israel many times is they have a problem and then they run back to God. God, you know, God fixes their problem for them. And then a few years later, they run away from God again and God sends them a problem. And they go right back to God and we see a cycle. But this time, he's sending them problem after problem and they're still not returning to God. You know, God may be trying to get your attention. 
in your life? God may be trying to get our attention. Is he sending problems into your life? Sickness, bills, problems at, uh, at home, problems at work, temptations. What is he using in your life to try to get your attention? Maybe he's using leaders in your life to try to wake you up, try to get your attention. Maybe he's using your friends. Maybe the Holy Spirit is working on you, trying to get your attention. What is he using to try to get your attention? God doesn't give up easily on his children. But how much has he already done in your life, and yet you've refused to return to where God wants you to go? In this fashion, we saw God use famine, use drought, use crop devastation, disease, war, tragic disasters, and yet... Israel was not persuaded. You know, I, uh, not every problem we face, I don't want you to think that every problem you face is somehow a wake-up call from God. There are problems that come along because we live in a world that is uh, cursed by sin. Not every problem you face is a wake-up call from God, but I will say every problem you face should draw you closer to God. Not every single problem you face is, is a wake-up call from God, but every problem you face should draw you closer to God. And... We see in verse number, uh, we, we see number three, we see that they were warned. No, I have four points tonight, and you're like, man, Pastor Ryan, you're flying through these. Don't worry, point number four will take a lot longer, so you can just uh, rest up and get comfortable. Okay, so God was trying to get their attention, right? And uh, he used all these different things to try to get their attention, and yet, and yet nothing. They wouldn't return to God. And we see, thirdly, they were warned. In verse number 12, and it sounds like it's a pretty... Intense where he says, Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. So he says, You know what? I've tried over and over and over again. And he's warning them. He's saying, You know what? If you guys don't turn to me, if you don't return to me, then it's over. Prepare to meet thy God. You know, you need to get ready because God's wrath is coming. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we get a warning. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. God warns us that we're going to be judged for our lives. One day, we're going to face that judgment. Just like Israel did. Just like with Israel, God told them, you know what? Judgment is coming. Prepare to meet thy God. For us, one day, judgment will be coming. We need to be prepared to meet our God. The, J, the day of judgment is imminent, so turn back to God today. You know, for some of us, in, some, some people in here, maybe it's not a matter of returning to God. Maybe it's a matter of coming to God for the first time. Maybe you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never understood what a relationship with God is. You've never gotten to that point, and you need to do that today. The fact is, judgment is coming. There's going to be a day that it's too late. You know, the Bible says, None of us know when we're gonna go, when we're gonna die. The Bible says, "Tomorrow, don't don't count on tomorrow, don't don't count that you're gonna have tomorrow because you could die today, and we don't know what's gonna happen next. So prepare to meet thy God. You know what? Uh, it's it's as simple. If if you've never had that relationship with Jesus Christ, it's as simple as trusting and believing in Him. You know, it, it doesn't take a bunch of good works. That's where the Israelites had it wrong. They thought that they did all these right things. That's what was going to fix the problem. Uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're worshiping in the wrong place, but as long as we do all these right things, as long as we're tithing every three years like we're supposed to, as long as we are going and giving sacrifices every morning, as long as we give the leaven and the unleavened uh, sacrifices, we're going to be good. No, that's not what it's about. It's about a relationship with God. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, accepted what he's done on the cross for you. He died on the cross to wash away your sin. All of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. The fact is, when judgment comes, every one of us deserve to be separated from God forever. But we don't have to be. So make sure that you're ready. We receive a warning. The, the day of judgment is imminent. So turn back to God today. You know, we don't know how much time we have left on this earth. So get back to God now. And you may say, well, I'm still young, you know. Many teenagers say, well, I still have a lot of years ahead of me. I want to have some fun first. I want to do some fun things. And then one day when I'm old and boring, then I'll get back to God and I'll start doing the, you know, the relationship with God thing and start going to church like I need to. And man, but I, not right now. I'm, I'm still young. Well, 
you don't know if you have tomorrow. You don't know if you have your old and boring years, right? You don't know if you have your years when you're as old as Mrs. Winters is. You don't, you don't know if you have those years, right? She's been blessed to live as long as she has, but we don't know if we'll have those years like her. So, but d- we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So don't, don't put it off. Don't put it off, guys. Tomorrow you could be standing before God having to give account of your life. That's saying whether what you've done is good or whether it's evil. It, it could be tomorrow. So we see that they were warned. We see that God, he was trying to get their attention, but we see that they missed it. You know, I uh, read a story the other day about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. They went on a camping, camping trip. And after they shared a meal together, they retired into their tent for the night. And at about 3 o'clock in the morning, Sherlock, he wakes up Watson. And he says, Watson, do you see those stars in the sky? And Watson says, well, yes, I see, I see millions of stars in the sky. I can't even count them all. I see the stars in the sky. And uh, Sherlock says, okay, well, what does that tell you? You know, always thinking, always uh, trying to deduct and figure out what this means. And Watson, he says, well, astronomically, it tells me that there's millions of galaxies. And in each galaxy, maybe billions of stars and planets and um, it tells me that theologically that God is great and we're small and insignificant. Um, it tells me that it's 3 o'clock a.m. And uh, meteorology, lo- uh, meteorology, logically, sorry about that. It tells me that we have a beautiful day tomorrow, that it's not going to rain. What does it tell you, Sherlock? And Sherlock says, well, it tells me somebody stole our tent. <laughs> and and uh, Watson, he missed what was going on, right? I mean, he was... He's trying to theorize about what Sherlock is seeing in these stars. And the fact is, somebody stole the tent right out from underneath them. And uh, the Israelites here, man, they completely missed it. I mean, they just, they, they missed it. And we see actually in chapter 5, I'm going to read a few of the verses there. Verse 4, verse 6, verse 8. But we're going to see that there's something God wants from them. It's not that, I mean, is it good that they were making sacrifices and tithing? Yes, those are good things to do, but that's not what he wants from them. And in chapter 5, he tells them what it is he wants from them. What can they do that they can escape the wrath of God, that they can escape the judgment that's coming? What does God want from them? Verse number 4 in chapter 5 says, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Verse number 6, Seek the Lord. And ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Verse number 8, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. They've completely missed the point. They're trying to do all of these right things. And yes, they've missed some of the, they're not worshiping in the right location. They've missed a couple of these things, but they're trying to do all the right things. God says, what I want from you is to seek me. What I want from you is for you to be close to me. What I want is to have a relationship with you, Israel. What I want is is to be able to to, to call you my friend, to be, to be close to you, for you to, to want to come to me, for you to be seeking me every day of your life. That is what he wanted. And they completely missed it. God, at this point, God is begging them to seek him. He's saying, please, would you, would you please just seek me? If you want to live, all you have to do is seek me. You don't got to be perfect. You don't got to do everything exactly right. I'll help you along the way. I just want you to seek me. I just want you to follow me. I just want you to come after me, to to want me. That's all I want from you. And he's begging them at this point, please, just seek after me. Just just come after me. Just, Just long for that relationship with me. And in the same way, he wants to have a relationship with you. And he's begging. He's saying, you know what? I know you go to church. I know you're a good person. I know you give. You may even read your Bible every day, but I just want you to seek me. I just want you to be close to me. The Bible says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. He just wants you to draw closer to him. And just to emphasize how badly they missed it, in verse number eight, God helps us understand a little bit who he is. Verse number, he says, okay, so who is this that wants to have a relationship with you? Who is this that wants to be close to you? Who is this that wants, it's not just 
your classmate who wants to be friends with you and you don't know if you want to be friends with them or not. Okay, it's not just, it's not even your teacher who wants to be friends. We're going to see, who is this that wants to be close to you, to have a relationship with you? It says, seek him that maketh the seven stars an Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with night and calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. In case you haven't caught it, He's saying, the person that wants to be close to you, yeah, he's the one that's created the stars. He, when you look up in the sky and see how beautifully the stars are placed, placed there and how there's more stars than you could possibly even count, yeah, the person that put every one of those stars up there, he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to seek him. Okay, uh, he turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark. With it. You know how when you go to bed at night, it's dark, and then when you wake up in the morning the sun comes up and then at night the sun goes back down again yeah the god that's in control of that sun wants to have a relationship with you he wants to be close to you he wants you to seek after him he calleth the waters of the sea and poureth them upon the face of the earth you know the god that's in control of you know this cool thing where the water goes up into the sky and then it comes back down as rain this morning man we got a lot of rain this morning that I drove here to church. I could barely see where I was going. But, man, it was just like torrential downpour. just came out of nowhere. And, you know, the God that controls the rain, that can make that happen, that makes the water come out of the oceans, out of the lakes, go up into the sky, and then come back down upon us and, and uh, take care of our fields and gives us the water that we need. The God that is in control of that, He wants you to seek Him. He wants you to have a relationship with Him. And He's saying, in case you missed it, Okay, let me emphasize one more time. The Lord is His name. Who are we talking? We're talking about the Lord. The Lord. Not a Lord. Not a God. Not, not just another one of those gods like these other countries. No, we're talking about the Lord. Wants to have a relationship with you. Wants you to seek after Him. Do you not realize who it is that wants you to seek Him? Amos is saying to Israel here, do you not, do you not get it? All you have to do is return to God. It's not that difficult of a thing. Even if you didn't have all these problems in your way, just the fact that the God of the universe wants you to seek Him and be close to Him should be enough. He wants you. He wants you. You know, uh, if, if somebody famous, let's say Mike Pence came here, okay, and whether you like him or you don't like him, let's say he was here and he came up to you personally and he gave you a little piece of paper with his cell phone number on it. And he said, hey, you know what? I want you to give me a call. I'd love to talk to you. You seem to have some really good ideas and I just love spending some time with you and talking to you, you know, nothing, uh, nothing serious. I, ju I just, I just want to talk to you. I would love to talk to you, spend some time with you. And he gave you that phone number. You know, probably what you do is you'd put that phone number in your pocket and you forget about it lose it and you know never end up calling him right no i mean you would i mean a lot of they, they would take that and be like okay no mike pence wants to talk to me I, i'm gonna call this guy i'm gonna talk to this guy and you know i don't know what he wants to talk about but i'm gonna call him anyways and it, it's a big deal i mean it's not just like some random guy off the street gave you his phone number no this is somebody everybody knows and everybody thinks is important and he wants me to call him i mean i'm, I'm not gonna pass up on that opportunity and if you just lose that phone number and you forget about it, then people would say, that's a wasted opportunity. And you could have had the ear of the Vice President of the United States. I mean, he cares what you think. He cares, man, if, if you could have talked to him, you could maybe you could have changed some things. Maybe you could have done something. Man, that, I can't believe you missed that opportunity. And yet, that's exactly what we do with God. God has given you direct access to him. God wants you to talk to him. You know, you can go home tonight, and you can sit down and you can pray and God will hear you. God will listen to you. You know, even if you did have Mike Pence's phone number, the, you know, he may or may not answer the phone. He may not care what you have to say, but God does care what you have to say. And God does want to hear from you. God does want you to seek him. And yet, sometimes we cast it aside. We forget about it. You know, we have God's word here. The very words of God written down for us and we just sit it down and forget about it till next Sunday where we pick it up again and go pretend that we're such good Christians at church. God has something special for you. God wants you to seek him. The Bible says in Revelations 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You know, God says here, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And this verse, it wasn't written to non-Christians. You know, I've heard some people use the verse and say, you know, that's God knocking on your heart, wanting you to get saved and come. To, you know, God, this is written to Christians, to the church. God says he's standing outside the church, knocking on the door, wanting to be let in. He's standing outside your life as a Christian, knocking on the door of your life saying, hey, Christian, can I be a part of your life? I mean, I know you, you do a lot of these Christian things. You go to church and you act like a, a good Christian and you, uh, you try to do the things that the Bible says, but I'm knocking on your life and I want to be a part of your life too. I want to be there. But we leave him waiting outside the door. Um, so yesterday, I, now if, if you guys, if anybody here knows me very well, you will know that I am not a handy person at all. My wife will say amen to that. I am not a very handy. Mr. Leteski was making fun of me on Friday. Or what, you were making fun of me the other day saying, you know, I don't know how you got, how you got a wife. You're not handy or handsome. You know, you got to be one or the other <laughs> to get a wife. I don't know. I managed to get one. God is good. But <clears throat> I am not a handy person. But yesterday, uh, I, I decided we, were, we replaced our toilet. A to, there's a toilet that there's been a lot of people that tell me it's a good toilet. So we replaced our toilet. And uh, there were some instructions with it. Right? Instructions are good. Whoa, guys! Uh, instructions are good. And so I used those instructions. And what I did with those instructions was I started putting the toilet together without looking at them. And then I realized maybe I should look at them a little bit. And then I went and got them. I looked at them. I skimmed over, looked at the things I thought I needed. I put it together. It ended up working out. It was fine. But I didn't, you know, if you asked me if I care who wrote that instruction manual, I, I could care less. I, I didn't use them that much. I looked at a few things in it. That was pretty much it. But a lot of us, we treat the Bible and we treat God like that instruction manual. We say, you know, I'll skim through it. I'll go try to do this life thing. And if I get stuck or if I'm not sure what to do here, I'll come back to the instruction manual. Say, well, what does the Bible say about that? Okay. I uh, got my solution. Now I'm going to keep going in my life. And if I hit another bump, I'm going to come back and say, okay, was that number four? Yeah, rule number four. Okay, got to get that fixed. We're, we're going we're gonna to fix that problem. And we use God like an instruction manual, not even really caring who wrote it. Yes, I mean, even the people who, you know, if, I've seen some people keep every instruction manual they've ever had. They put it up on the shelf and they, they take really good care of them, laminate them, and they, they keep them right just in case they ever have a problem. And even those people probably have no clue who wrote their instruction manual. And a lot of times that's how we treat God's word. Say, well, it, it, it is helpful and I, I read it every day so that it can help me and I keep it, I put it up on a shelf and it looks real nice. When people come in, they, they see my Bible, they see how, how good of a Christian I am, but you have no relationship with the person who wrote it. This isn't just an instruction manual. This is not just a book that you look at in order to help you figure out how to live your life. Now, it, it does have instructions. It does help us live our life the right way. But that's not, that's not all it is. This is not just an instruction manual. This is written from a God who wants to be close to you. Who wants you to seek Him. Who wants you to come to this book, not just looking for instructions, but looking for a relationship. Seeking after God, just like the Israelites were supposed to seek after God. We need to seek after God. You know, it seems like it's such an obvious choice that needs to be made. We look in verse 14 and, uh, of chapter 5, and Amos seems to make the case that it's a pretty obvious choice as well. He says, Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you, and ye have spoken. It says, you know, he says, okay, go for the good stuff. Seek good and not evil. That seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Like, choose the right, make the right choice here. I've, I've explained all this to you. I've explained that God's done all these things to try to get you to come back to him. I've explained to you who God is and the fact that he wants you to seek after him. So make the right choice. Seek good. Don't seek evil. Why? So the Lord God of hosts shall be with you. It's an easy choice, guys. You know, there's a lot of choices in life that are difficult. You know, what am I good? Where do we want to eat tonight? You get in the car with a few people, you're about to go out to eat, and you say, where do we want to eat? Man, 
that is a hard question, is it not? I mean, nobody wants to answer, and once somebody, one person does answer, everybody else says how that is the worst possible place you could ever eat, and everybody's arguing and trying to figure out where we're going to eat, but nobody wants to say where it is they want to eat, just they don't want to go there, and it, it's hard choices, but some choices in life are easy. You know, if I said, hey, would you rather go to Disneyland, or I can send you to prison? Up to you. You probably say, well, I guess I'll go to Disneyland. You know, out of those two, I might go to Disneyland. I can say, well, here, we got two cups here for you. This one is pure water, nice and cold with ice in it, and this cup has poison that will kill you. Which one would you like to drink? Pretty obvious choice, right? There's a lot of, there, there's some obvious choice in my life. One of the most obvious choices for me was marrying my wife. It was an obvious choice. No better option out there for sure. She's the best choice I could have made. And uh, obvious, right? And that's what he's saying. This is an obvious choice, guys. Seek God or don't. Anything this world could possibly offer weighted against a relationship with the Almighty God. It's an obvious choice. And yet we're over here. We're, we're oh, looking at all these things the world has to offer. And say, well, you know what? It's a, we make it seem like such a difficult choice. And, well, well today I'm going to be over here. And tomorrow I guess I'll try to seek after God over here. But, that's, guys, it's an obvious choice. You can either seek God or you can seek whatever it is this world has to offer to you. And I promise you, God is better. You know, there's an obvious choice that needs to be made today. Are you going to seek God or are you going to turn away from Him? There's no in between. I think sometimes we convince ourselves there's a third option. There's some in between there. Well, I'm not really seeking God like actively but I'm not like turning away from God and running from Him either. I'm kind of in that middle section. No, there's no middle section. You're either seeking God or you're turning away from God. And it's your choice today. He wants to have a relationship with you. What is it going to take for Him to get your attention? Is He going to have to send problems into your life? Is He going to have to send people to try to give you a wake-up call? What is it He's going to have to do to get your attention? Or are you going to say, God, in my life, I want to seek you. In my life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no to what this world has to offer, however good it may seem to me in this moment, and I'm going to seek after you. He's given us so many ways to do it. And you know what? Like with the Israelites, God knows you're not going to be perfect. Now, does God want us to do the right things? Does God want us to be in church on Sunday? Does God want us to tithe? There's a lot of things that, yeah, God does want us to do, but that's not the point. The point is seeking God. The point is a relationship with God, a walk with God. And today, you have a choice. Do you want to seek God or do you want to turn away from God? Lord, I thank you so much for loving us enough to keep chasing after us. Lord, I, I thank you so much for wanting to have a relationship with us, for wanting to be close to us. And I pray that you would help me and help each of us not to take that for granted, Lord that we would actively seek you every day, that we would do everything we can to be close to you, Lord, that we'd draw nigh to you, that you would draw nigh to us. I pray that you would bless our invitation in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you say, Pastor Ryan, as you were talking, I realized not only do I need to return to God, but I've never had a relationship with God. I've never come to that point that I asked Jesus to wash my sins away and take me to heaven. I've never come to that point that I asked Jesus to take away the sin that was between me and him. And I want to do that today. If you say, Pastor Ryan, I've never asked Jesus to be my savior, but I'd like to do that today. Would you raise your hand? Amen. If you say, Pastor Ryan, I already know I'm going to heaven. I've already had that relationship with Jesus Christ. But today, I need to make the decision to return to him. I need to make the decision to return to God. I've let other things get in the way of my relationship with him. I've allowed myself to be pulled away from God, and I need to return to him. I need to make that obvious choice to seek after God. If that's you, would you raise your hand? And praise the Lord. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would help us to seek after you. Lord, too put you first in everything that we do, that we would, we would long after you, long for a relationship with you. In Jesus' name. As we stand together, as the piano plays, if God has spoken to you tonight, 
please come do business with the Lord.